Bob Murphy, it's a pleasure to see you uh, on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Always a pleasure. Well, so you've uh, you've released this this new book on on Bitcoin, um, and it's very exciting. I can't say that I've read the entire thing, but of course we've been through this intellectual journey together. Um, I guess as almost everybody in the Bitcoin space has, but you and I have a special sort of background that that makes us both intrigued um, at this. In the course of researching it, what was your what was your sense of things? Did you learn some new stuff? Uh, is there things in your book you uh, you think are particularly notable? Yeah. So uh, for those hearing this, it's it's understanding Bitcoin. If you go to understandingbitcoin.us, you can get the latest version. We'll just keep updating it. And what I did is I grabbed this guy, uh, Silas Barda, who's been kind of hanging around libertarian Austrian circles. I've known him for a while, and I realized he built a, a mining rig just off, with off-the-shelf graphics cards and things, and what I really didn't even understand what Bitcoin was. And so I knew he understood the math behind it, and he was also pretty good at using analogies to explain what was going on with mining. And so I, I realized, okay, I can, you know, if, if he and I team up, because I wanted to talk about the economics of it, and I realized he could explain. So the, the point of our guide is to say, look, if you know, if you have no math background and you want to read one thing, there's like an introduction to give you enough about the mechanics of it so you can, can see how it works and then draw your own opinions or conclusions. Because that was, I think you've seen this too, Jeff. People will be arguing about Bitcoin and the implications, and it's clear they don't really know how it even works. You know, like when, when Mount Gox happened, for example, I was like, yeah, see, it was supposed to be secure. And it was like, well, yes and no. So I, um, I, I think it's important before people draw conclusions about it to have a basic understanding of how it works. And that's what we try to give in this guide is just to explain uh, the, the basic mechanics. You don't have, any, have to have any prior math background, and yet I think we give you enough that you really do understand what's going on. And then I try to place it in the context of free market monetary theory. Right. And, you know, so I think, you know, you and I have known Hayek, you know, had his denationalization of money. And so for a while I was thinking in terms of, oh, yeah, maybe you could have a fee at money as long as it's privately issued and there's competition. But that still relied on trust. And that's what's so fascinating about Bitcoin is it's this privately produced, you could call it a fiat currency if you want to in, in that sense. But it's no one's in charge of it, not even one private company. And so it's a, it's an interesting thing that certainly Hayekians ought to really study just for its own sake because it's such an interesting idea. Well, a lot of times people think they know how it works because they just hear the, the, the short version. Oh, here's a, uh, a, a, a digitally created, you know, digitally managed currency. And then your brain turns around and says, oh, well, that, that can't possibly work. I know that's what happened to me. I mean, that's how I was dismissing Bitcoin in like 2011 and even in as early as, uh, even as late as 2012 without really looking into uh, the, its structure and, and how it works. And I mean, the first confusion that I overcame was this the point about the limits on Bitcoin. I mean, that was the thing that sort of made me realize, okay, I don't understand this, you know. Right. So I threw myself into it. Uh, but another major confusion that I always like, almost every speech uh, I talk about this, is how Bitcoin unites a, a currency and payment system. That, that's something we haven't encountered before. Right, and that's actually why I think that this has a potential. It's, in a sense, even a harder currency than even gold or silver would be. I mean, for two reasons. One is, in principle, they could always find more gold or silver, or you know, they could go out and, the, and mine it from asteroids or something. So even if the world did embrace and went back to using gold as money, which for a long time I've thought, well, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. That would be the best thing. In principle, there could still be an inflationary influx that would make – gold untenable is the money, whereas with Bitcoin, that, that really can't happen, at least not in that sense, that you know there is that mathematical limit built into the protocol itself. But then beyond that is what you're bringing up here, and this this didn't even hit me until we were writing the last sections of the, of the guide that we wrote, is that because it is married to a payment system, if people used Bitcoin as the money or, you know, some other currency like it, then they would be less reliant on, on intermediary banks and so there's less there be it'd be more likely that the free market response of the of bank reserves would be closer to 100% because in effect bitcoin with your own wallet allows you to have your own checking account and so if you think about you know just the, i don't want to get too much into the weeds but in the standard models like in the free banking literature about privately held you know without having a central bank bailing them out or anything 
which is what's the equilibrium reserve ratio for checking accounts, the more competition you have, the more banks that you know that you think it would be end up being higher. And so, in a sense, Bitcoin allows everybody to, to have his own checking account if he wants to, you know, like in terms of your wallet. So I, I think that there's a lot of reasons that Austrian libertarians, in particular, if they haven't really given it a chance, should get into it and don't just take you know one guy's opinion to say no, no, no don't don't get into that. That's silly. Like you should, I would recommend re learn enough about it so you know how the thing works because there. If this does work, it, it really has tremendous consequences. Yeah, it, it does. And I've, I've, I've myself tried to avoid all these kind of detailed arguments about theory that, that used to consume us, you know, over, over decades, really, uh, about, um, you know, 100% reserves and uh, monetary equilibrium theory and these kind of things. But they, they are relevant to some extent. I mean, do you think that within the Bitcoin space we're actually going to see an empirical test of a lot of the issues that have consumed banking theory for the last couple of hundred years? In other words, uh, like we don't have to sit around and theorize. We can just you know watch and see what happens. Yes. The quick answer is yes. I mean, in the wake of Mt. Gox and some of the other uh, scandals, I mean, there are plenty of Bitcoin exchanges that are holding more than 100% reserves right now. And so, I mean, that's an interesting thing, whereas in the traditional Austrian arguments over free banking, you know, we're talking about, well, what happened in Scotland in the 1800s, and that's kind of what we have to deal with, and people argue about that, and it's, you know, whereas... And they're always in perfect systems, so you're, you're kind of left to speculate. Right, whereas now you can see stuff in real time, like you're saying, and we have plenty of, of evidence, or the arguments over the regression theorem, and, and I've admitted this to other people before, probably to you too, if you had asked me in 2005 is something like Bitcoin possible, I probably would have said no because it would never get off the ground. How would anybody know right. the value well, at the beginning? But, and so, you know, <laughs> Bitcoin has shown that, you know, th there was a way it happened and flourished that I would have not have thought possible. And right. so we kind of and left trying to explain what happened. But a lot of this is due to the fact that, uh, you know, as a monetary economist, and somebody who's talking about Bitcoin, you only think about it in terms of money. Um, we weren't prepared to think about this in terms of uh, a, a valuable payment system uh, alongside it. And and that's, for me, like the great lesson I've learned from Bitcoin is don't try to outsmart the market. You know, even as a theorist, there's things that are possible that, that you personally can't, you know, imagine. And, uh, uh, and, and putting these two things together, uh, uh, the payment system as the use value for... A money is just. I don't think. I honestly, I don't think Bob and I, I feel like I've read a lot of literature. I don't think anybody fully anticipated something like that. I mean, not even Hayek. You know, where he's he's spinning out possible scenarios. Right. Uh, we could have a, a kind of a new a privately produced currency. You know, nowhere does he say. Well, let's just say that the use value of the currency is its its capacity to be ex exchanged itself in a technologically interesting way. I mean, he never said anything remotely like that. Right. I mean, even in the beginning when I was first studying Bitcoin, I was just focusing on it as, you know, basically a, a system of, I mean, even the analogies that I use to try to get it across, I'm just imagining that it's this scarce thing. It's like the community jointly recognizing who owns these abstract and but, but scarce items. And right. for me, that, that was the issue, like just the distribution of understanding of who owns what. It was like a system of property titles because then that could be money. And I didn't really worry so much about how they were exchanged among each other because oh, you got to get into the cryptography, and I don't want to get into that yet. Exactly. But you know, and it, it's but it's neat. You go to the you know um, the original white paper on it. I mean that it, the the fact that it's a payment system is right in the title. So clearly, yeah. those two things were married together, you know, in the creators of Bitcoin minds up front. So you, you're right. I think it's part of the issue is people just want to focus on one little element, and they just say stuff. That yeah. people who know more about it realize that no, you just you don't even you know maybe your conclusion's right, but you really don't know what you're talking about. So you got to right. learn a little bit more before you start shooting off your opinion. Well, we focus on the thing we know and we care about. This is why the first time I read the white paper, it made no sense to me like at all because I was looking for an explanation of where this where this money you know came from, right. and uh, and the white paper just focuses entirely on on blockchain technology and. And every time I bumped into a word I didn't understand, I would kind of blast by it, you know. So, yeah, I mean, for me in the spring of 2013, I finally just sat down and thought, okay, I'm going to have to read about cryptography. You know, I'm going to have to figure this stuff out. 
And um, yeah, and like earlier, for example, you asked me, did I learn anything? And and yes, I in working with Silas on this guy because he would write sections, I would read them, you know, drafts, and I would say, you know what, I I still don't get it, so it's still too hard, you know. And then stuff was just clicking for me, like how mining pools work, or like something that's obvious to people in the area, but was new to me was the idea that well, you sort of you're you're using your private key to to digitally authenticate a transfer order that's broadcast to the network and say, so well, gee, if, if that's like your signature, why couldn't someone just copy it? Like once they see what your signature is, why couldn't some rogue put out a fake order with your signature? And their answer is, well, because the signature itself changes based on the transaction, but only you have the ability to generate it. So it's not like John Hancock in zeros and ones that's the same regardless of the transaction. Your actual unique identifying signature changes and is intrinsically related to the transaction. So someone can't change the numbers a little, the amounts, the Bitcoin amounts, and put your signature because your signature itself would be different. So just things like that, when you understand it more, you just kind of appreciate that whatever the thing ends up doing down the road, this is just an amazing accomplishment of the human mind. This is just a fascinating idea. Well, and, and there's other features of, of Bitcoin's operation that are, were kind of lost on me for a long time. But one was, like, I didn't understand for a long time that you can have potentially an unlimited number of public addresses associated with a single private key. You know, that was, that was amazing to me. And I only discovered that once Coinbase installed that technology so that every new transaction, you know, uses a different public address. Uh, I didn't get that for a long time. Um, and uh, just the other day when I was in, I was in New Zealand, I had a revelation because I paid for a helicopter ride with, with Bitcoin and realized that Bitcoin overcomes the problem of, of uh, national exchange rates, which, you know, like I, I didn't entirely understand that either. You know, like I was converting out of New Zealand dollars into American dollars and into Bitcoin and back again. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm taking a step that's unnecessary here. It's just a yeah. Bitcoin price, you know, and that's it. Yeah, and that's the thing. As I was thinking more about it, and this really hit me when I went to the the Texas Bitcoin conferences. When this, it was, so what was that? Was that 2014 or 13? I get my years mixed up. But that's when it really clicked for me as to why this thing was powerful. As I as I was just realizing, if you're able to send somebody payment, and all you need is to get online, like how much that just connects the world. Because people are like, oh, what are we talking about? I could I could do that with with PayPal or these. Like, well, no, because if 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 some if a government leans on PayPal and says we don't want you giving donations to WikiLeaks or whatever, they might back off. And so, but the point is that no, here if it is this distributed public ledger that there's thousands of copies all over Earth, that you, there's no one choke point that can be shut down. That even powerful states can't just lean on that one conduit and then make it hard to send payment to people. And once you realize that, you know, there could be people in some South American country where the the soldiers are going around stealing anything of value. And if you can just sell your stuff and get it in terms of Bitcoins, you can send it out of the country or have it on a little, you know, something in your pocket or something, or just even you can just remember what your private key is. If you have a good memory and you trust. So, I mean, it's really amazing the, the options and the way it allows people around the world to just connect with each other economically. Once you fully think through the ramifications of what something like Bitcoin allows. One of the things that I noticed, like at the Texas Bitcoin conference, for example, there's a lot of talk about uh, multi-signatures. I mean, just 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 to kind of give an explanation of that, um, you know, when Bitcoin first came out, it was just all the, your, your wallet was just a ta and the ability to uh, use your wallet to uh, enact translation uh, tr transactions and things was tied to individual volition, and you couldn't make that contingent upon multi parties. Uh, approving um, uh, that transaction, at least at least conceptually, it was possible, but it wasn't. It wasn't. We didn't really have the technology even a year ago. Now, most of the major exchanges have very easy interfaces for for bringing about multi-signature transactions. So this is important for firms, and it's important for uh, wills and and other sorts of things. Um, for me, it's been very interesting to watch how, like, speculations of a year ago are now coming into reality. That's how fast things are moving. Yeah, and that's, uh, and it was funny, Tatiana Moroz actually was the one who pushed me into going to one of these Bitcoin conferences, and she said, I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect that, you know, the, these other Liberty type events, people are real depressed and just sitting around and just, you know, waiting for the end. 
Whereas with these Bitcoin ones, like people are creative and they're producing things. Like they're all bubbling around saying, oh, look at my idea. What if we did it this way? And, and, I, and I didn't know what she meant at first, but I went and I, once I got there, I saw what she meant, that these are real creative people who are coming up with what they think can be a solution that helps. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I'm stereotyping here, but it, was, it just had a different feel to it compared to other places where, you know, sometimes you just get this message that, oh, my gosh, the Federal Reserve is unstoppable and the police states come. There's nothing we can do. Just wait for the end as you go over the waterfall. And so that, that's also what I like about this, that it's this gives a new platform and people, it sort of sets them free to go to say, hey, we have this new infrastructure that more and more people are adopting and what can we do with this? It's it's like having the internet, like before, if you just thought the internet was going and, and looking at what your store has available and then being able to send an email to people and that's what you thought it was, hey, that's kind of neat. And I think that's kind of what Bitcoin is right now, like what we're imagining that it can do for us. And you've done this a lot in your public talks at least, saying how it's not Bitcoin per se, it's like the blockchain. Like that's really, you know, and, and you, you've been focusing how it's, it's, it's a bigger thing. The Bitcoin is just one example in this new genre of ways humans can interact with each other. Yeah, I mean, it, just the capacity, and I've tried to explain this to people, the, the capacity to, to bundle, commodify, and title information and port it to any other an individual user in the world in a way that's time-stamped you know, non-forgeable, non-repeatable, and you know, ver verified and guaranteed and, and basically made permanent is like an awesome thing that you could do. And once you realize that that's the technology, then money, yes, is part of it and integral to it, but it's not the only application. There's so many other applications, and now we've seen those actually come online. Uh, uh, yeah, tell me this. I wonder if you've, you've experienced this too at, at conferences and things. The, the real innovators in the space and the code slingers uh, and, and the people that are really doing a lot of these Bitcoin 2.0 uh, technologies are kind of presuming an atmosphere of, of total f freedom. In other words, their innovations are not like circumscribed by the, by the, uh, the possibility of regulations and limits. Uh, and then at the same conference, it's eventually there'll be like like a a, a uh, um, uh, you know a panel on government regulations, you know, right. and 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 it's it's like brought up as an as an after effect, right? It, yeah, and, and I yeah, there has and I want to make sure that your listeners recognize in case they haven't been to these conferences, it's not an ideological thing. I mean, the the reason people go to these conferences is because they're interested in Bitcoin. So you'll have people there who, you know, maybe they voted for Obama or something. You know, it's not it's it's not that they're ideological, but there are people there. And that's part of what we're trying to do with our guide is I want to ex go both ways to explain to people who are interested in libertarian philosophy and that kind of stuff why you should take Bitcoin seriously and look at the, the, the impact it could have, but then also to this, the standard Bitcoin people to get them to realize why are these other groups so interested. Because, yeah, these conferences, it seems like there was two groups. Like there's people interested in the commercial application and just the pure coders and so forth, and they were over here in one corner, and then there are people over here who are interested in the, the implications for human freedom, and a lot of times they couldn't communicate with each other very well. Uh, it, it, it just on that last thing. point, too, you brought up, Jeff, that it's – I noticed that in the, uh, in the, the finance literature – like the you know, economics where, where people have these esoteric modeling like Fisher Black and guys like that. And a lot of times there, they, they just build the, the model of how financial markets would work without assuming any regulation because it's just, it's pure. You know what I mean? Like it's like you really push this limit or this idea to its limit in that kind of a wind tunnel. And then they go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course the SEC is going to come in. But I'm talking about this is how the thing would work, you know, and it's – right. And it's not because they're anarchists. It's just because when you're a scientist or a theorist, you start, you know, from the simple level and build it there, and then throw on the other stuff as an afterthought. Uh, I wonder if you've heard. I, I I bumped into a couple of objections recently to Bitcoin that I thought were were fascinating. Uh, one was uh, um, uh, it was in New Zealand. There's a guy who had studied monetary equilibrium theory, and said he didn't think that Bitcoin would actually work as a monetary system because it's not responsive enough to changes in supply and, and, and demand for money. Uh, and I thought that was, and I think there's an answer to that, obviously. The, I think the answer comes from, from the price itself, right? But, uh, which is, which is uh, moves 
um, according to uh, you know changes uh, in supply and, and the demand for money. But um, but I, I enjoyed the discussion because it was fairly sophisticated uh, uh, critique and, and illustrates part of the problem where uh, and r that comes from sort of trying to impose a theory on on, an, on what's basically an, an emergent uh, technology. Right, uh, and I agree. I agree with you on all the elements of that. That it is interesting that he's applying a fairly high level, you know, s subtle critique. But, but I think you're right. The answer is simply well, prices adjust and. And also, too, in the type of world where the majority of humans use Bitcoin or some other type of currency like that, it, I think prices would be a lot more flexible, right? And so the, the reason traditionally people worry about, oh, gee, could, prices re could the purchasing power of money switch enough in case there's a massive change in demand, that's because people talk, oh, there's sticky wages and sticky – well, in a really electronic universe where everything is traded online or many things are traded, you know – with computers, you would think the prices would be a lot more flexible in that kind of environment, anyway. So that that fear really isn't doesn't worry me. But on top of that, the part of the reason you have these big swings in the demand for money is when there are financial crises or you know depressions and so forth. And so if the whole world or a large fraction is using something like Bitcoin, you're not going to see that. So you're going to have you know the the long run equilibrium of slow and steady growth, or perhaps rapid and steady growth. Is going to be the norm. It's not like there's going to be these wild business cycle swings, at least if the Austrians are right about what causes the business cycle, which you know we we think they are. So it's I think a lot of it is a, is a worry about you know they're they're looking at what happens with state issued money and all the problems it causes, but that isn't even going to be an issue. Another funny uh, critique I've heard recently. I, I like these kind of like higher level critiques, as I'm bored with the people who say it's just a Ponzi scheme or something like that. But it comes it comes from the left, and it's the same criticism that was oftentimes made of of, of the gold standard. In fact, it's a very common criticism of the gold standard that there's there's wasted use of resources. Like, why should we go through all this trouble of of mining gold, digging it out of mountains, uh, right. porting it here, porting it there? It's it's much more efficient. It makes a lot more sense just to have a government fiat system so we can save on resource costs. And I've heard that same uh, critique made of, of Bitcoin. You know, we've got these, these gigantic uh, server farms all, you know, all over China and, and strange places like Iceland or wherever you can find cheap electricity that are doing nothing but just like grinding away, uh, confirming transactions and, and, and mining, mining Bitcoin. And it, and it seems like, like, a, like, a, like a waste, you know, to a, a constructivist mind who's looking from the outside, they're like, this system is not efficient. Why are we doing this? Yeah, it, it is funny. And I, I saw that in particular from Paul Krugman. That was one of his things. And, you know, in his mind, we have perfectly good functioning state-issued fiat currency. Why don't we, even as he's lamenting how these idiot central bankers and the ECB and the Fed aren't doing what he, Krugman, thinks they need to do to end this depression now. So, I mean, even within his own worldview, he has to admit that the incompetence of central bankers is leading to a worldwide depression for years on end. Again, even in his own, you know, we would say the same thing, but we'd flip the causality. But the point is, you know, clearly there are downsides to your approach and the, you know, the beauty of this. And the other thing too is, and I've I've heard people say stuff like, but Bob, you know, as the block, you know, as the transactions get larger and larger, I mean, pretty soon we're going to be talking about terabytes of recording. But can you imagine how much memory they're going to have? You know what I mean? Like this is the advances in, in computer storage and so forth. I mean, at this point, I was I, I go to the karaoke bar, and with my phone, I take little clips of my songs and send them to my dad to say, hey, did I hit that note or not, or what do you think? And I'm sending more information for my stupid karaoke trying to song that's out of my range than probably, you know, humanity sent during World War II or something. You know what I mean? It's, it's really – so this idea that that's going to be the constraint, like, oh, we're not going to have enough storage to store all these transactions in 20 years. That Come on. That, that's not going to be an issue. It's, it's going to be a piddly little – percentage of, of humanity's total computational power is to right. keep this beautiful money in place that it facilitates all of our transactions that that's going to be resources well devoted if you will to well, that, to me, that. There's, a, there's also a Hayekian point here too I mean no individual mind is is likely or <clears throat> probably cannot come up with an objection or a, a problem uh, that's associated with Bitcoin that the crowdsourced information that that filters to the core developers in other words the market itself can't come up with in other words you, you can't actually outsmart it like if you can think of a problem then that that problem has already been thought of most likely 
Right, and, and that's the beauty of libertarian you know, theory in general. When people come up with this, you know, oh, we couldn't have private police where we're going to have a private mill because of this. Would... And it's like, well, you don't think people, you know, if, if you came up with that, well, so can everybody else. And, you know, let's think about that. So it's, and, and there's also this issue too. It's not as if we're sticking a gun to everyone's head and saying you have to use Bitcoin. I mean, people can still hold gold and there could still be, uh, you know, of the gold Bitcoin exchange ratio, and you know what I mean. So it's not as if, oh my gosh, we're all putting our eggs in one basket, and if it blows up in our face, then we're going to have to go back to barter. That that's not really the issue. So uh, I, I do think it's it's going to happen in practice. More and more people will adopt it, and more you know there'll be sort of a, a reserve asset there. But then eventually, I think yeah, you're going to see communities where a given person might be able to go through most of his daily transactions just using Bitcoin or if something replaces it down the road, something like Bitcoin. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this, because um, I think you and I come from the same tradition, the same orientation, just generally. Um, what Bitcoin did for me is it it caused me to uh, rethink what money uh, is. Like I think that I used to have this view view that something was either money or it was not money, and that that like when once you jump from one to the other, you've really made this leap, and there's no sort of gray area in between. Uh, but as we've watched uh, Bitcoin emerge gradually over the last five years, you do see something something that's a lot more complicated, uh, where it's 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 not money, and then it becomes a little bit money-like for a handful of people for a certain number of uses. And then that that's gradually building up, and and like 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 right now. Um, there's plenty of firms out there in the world that are using Bitcoin for accounting purposes, but not that many, you know. It's and for the most part, the new adoptees are just, you know, accepting Bitcoin as a payment method and converting it immediately to national money. So we've got a ways to go before it becomes like this archetype of, you know, what we call money. Um, so I've had to change my own uh, feeling for for what an emergent money looks like and feels like. Did, did that happen to you also? It, it, it did. You're setting me up beautifully for this because in the guide, you know, look drawing on standard, you know, Mangarian, Misesian monetary theory, it's crystal clear what when something is a medium of exchange, right? That you're accepting that thing because you intend to trade it away in the future, not because you're going to use it directly. That's what it is, and that's crystal clear bifurcation. Um, but then Mises says, you know, it's not as obvious when is something a money and the sort of general definition say, oh, it's a medium of exchange that's generally accepted within a community. And so you're right. I tried to apply that to Bitcoin. And I was like, but wait a minute, because I think they kind of had in the back of their mind, they just assumed that the community was people who are all in geographical proximity. That's because true. there are there are plenty of people on earth right now that their number one thing, if, if you want to pay them, they will say first and foremost, pay me in Bitcoin if you have it. I, that And then... If you don't, okay, yeah, I'll accept dollars or euros or gold or whatever, and and so you, there are probably you know there are thousands of people, let's say, who their number one thing, if you're going to try to pay them, they would say, I, my first choice would be Bitcoin. But yet, does that mean those people all put together Bitcoin as money to them? And I want and in the guide, I I made the judgment call and said, not really, because they can't pay their rent in Bitcoin and they can't go get their grocery because they're not, you know what I mean? If they were if it gets to the point where they can just get enough of their com economic transactions with other people in that community so they can get through life only buying and selling with Bitcoin, then clearly that's a money. But right now, you know, it's still a – but there are people who, you know, as almost like a publicity stunt, will go out and try to live a year just using oh. Bitcoin, that kind of stuff. It's not even a publicity stunt. Last yeah. night on Liberty.me, we heard uh, uh, the John Bush's family, the wife of – sorry, I can't remember. Sure, I can't remember her name, but they were. Yeah. yeah, you know her. She traveled. They traveled all over the U.S. using Bitcoin, and she talked about just you know just the the difficulties here. Um, there's an app called Airbits, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a, an around me app for Bitcoin. So uh, you know they can find hotels that accept it. They can take flights that accept it. You know they can right. get food. But but uh, the major problem they faced is getting, and it's not for them. You know, it's it's not for them just like a like an intellectual challenge. I mean, this is a family that actually is living off Bitcoin. You know, right. so uh, so the big problem they're facing was was of all things just getting gas. You know, getting a way to fill up the tank of their yeah. car, and that turns out to be the biggest challenge that they face. But as I listened to her talk, I mean, it was intriguing because here you have a family that's been entirely Bitcoinized. You know. Mm -hmm. But um, and and a, a large part of their lives can be 
can be uh, conducted using Bitcoin, but there's still pockets where it's it's not working for them, you know. So, but you know, uh, so here you have this emergent quality. I mean, I I listen to this thing with just you know total fascination. I, I know I go through this myself. Like I try to use Bitcoin for for hotels or rents, car rentals or something like that, and I stop after you know one or two Google searches and a you know a, a couple of tricks. And I think, well, that's not available. But no, for them. You know they'll they'll uh, they'll use uh, four or five apps. You know and combine their all their features to and, do and anything. That, and that, and you know and it's a it's an exponential process where is it's so it's great that there are people and I confess you know I I'm certainly not I'm still new to using it in my daily life. You know what I'm saying? Like people say to me, "Do you accept Bitcoin?" I said, "Sure thing. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. If you want to pay me in Bitcoin, I'll I'm fine to do that." Um, but it's but that's the thing is people don't – in other words, the critics will say, oh, come on, these restaurants, where they're just accepting it because they know there's a certain demographic that will pay them and they'll attract those people. But they're not, they're not hanging on to it. They're immediately you know, cycling it out for dollars or whatever, whatever the currency is. But that's all you would need just is more and more people because there are plenty of people who want to use Bitcoin, but they don't because, like you say, they're going to hit all these roadblocks. So the more – Restaurants, and then if some gas station then starts, you know, if Exxon says okay, and, and select stations on the interstate will take Bitcoin. I mean, that all of a sudden will make it more practical, and it's just a snowball effect. So it does take people doing that, and that's why I would encourage pe people who really believe in it. It actually helps if you go around to your, you know, favorite bars or whatever, and you ask the owner, "Do you accept Bitcoin?" Because even if he's, if the answer is no, if you're the tenth person that's asked that, the guy might say. Maybe I should, you know, and have his staff like go go look into that. Is it a big deal? How would we do that? And so it's it's the kind of thing where everyone would start using it if everyone's using it. And you know what's funny when you go back and read read Principles of Economics by Menger and actually read his story about where money comes from. Uh, what you're seeing take place right now is not inconsistent. I mean, he does he d describes a process of of discovery, experimentation, and unfolding uh, knowledge that can last you know decades and decades. Uh, or longer before something becomes this, you know, this final product uh, of this thing that we we call uh, money. But there's a lot of stages in between, um, and it's it's nice. In other words, money emerges. What you get from that mega story is that money emerges the same way any other product in the in the market, you know, emerges through through experimentation, entrepreneurship, and trial and error, error and a gradual un unfolding of of practice. And that's what I'm trying to do, incidentally. You know, with this guide that we wrote, is because, like, we all know the story about what, what are the qualities of gold and silver? How come they became the market's money of choice? It's oh, because they're divisible, and you know, you gold is gold, whereas like two diamonds of, of comparable weight. You know, like if you have one huge diamond that weighs a pound, and ten smaller diamonds that collectively weigh a pound, those aren't the same thing. Whereas, you know, right. an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, that kind of stuff. But you know, if, if that weren't obvious to people, like if you really needed to be trained in metallurgy or something to really understand how gold even worked physically as an element, well, then maybe it would have taken longer for gold to catch on. You know what I mean? So the insiders would have realized this yellow metal is, is a wonderful money, but if they couldn't get their fellow man to realize that, well, then maybe gold wouldn't have become the money. So that's trying what we're doing. Like when we recognize how great it would be if lots of people that used accepted Bitcoin as payment, then... You know that that's why part of the why we want to evangelize and just make sure people realize. Do you see how this thing works? Is because I think a lot of people don't accept it right now because they really just don't understand it. You know, um, I was I was talking with a guy who spent a couple of years in prison, and I asked him. I said, uh, "Oh, I'm so interested in that, the many things, but I'm also I'm especially interested in what your money was." And he said to me, "Oh, that's that's easy, uh, ramen noodles." <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> yeah, and so it became, you know, the 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 medium of exchange in, in jail. This is like like now, you know. Right. People have to have a medium of exchange when one doesn't work that well, then another one another one comes along. And it's beautiful because I didn't entirely understand this. I always thought we'd have to have a top-down reform, and now we see the reform happening. Oh, by the way, um, and it, it, this reform doesn't just affect money, although that's what's interesting to you and me, but uh, from a payment point of view, I mean, you know, the inefficiencies associated with, the, with credit, credit cards, I, um, I got a call the other day, there's credit card fraud, this is like the sixth time this has happened to me, you know, my card, my card number was fished from somewhere, some public mm -hmm. internet probably, and uh, somebody attempted to use it for something that 
that my profile at, at Visa said that it's not the kind of thing I would normally buy, and they refused the transaction, called me up, canceled my card, and I said, my God, you know, how often does this happen to you, to the woman? And she said, look, from the very early morning to, to, I, to, I, to I clock out, this is all I do, and I've never seen anything like this, the amount of, of fraud that's out there. And and the, the amount of specialized knowledge. I mean, can you imagine how much specialized knowledge Visa has to have about you and your spending habits to be right. able to discern the difference between something you would buy or something you would not buy? Right. Uh, and this wasn't an obvious thing at all. It was it was a, an attempt to charge at a uh, a big box uh, kind of a combination grocery and hardware store, um, and they just recognized that that's not the kind of thing I would do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to you know an end to that kind of system, which is so so full of of of, of uh, fallibility, you know, and you yes. know we're all just so dependent upon these institutions and and the tens and really hundreds of billions of dollars they spend trying to protect against fraud. Uh, it it just it it's it's to me the whole system is just like crying out for another technology to replace it, you know. Right, and what what I didn't appreciate until. Um you know, my business partner and I have a, an annual event in Nashville and, you know, we have to sell tickets and whatever and take that in and everyone wants to do everything online now. And so, of course, people want to pay with their credit card. That's what everybody does when you order something online. And so that's a process. If, you're, if you've never been on the merchant end of that, to set that up and to get authorized.net to go through, I mean, it's a, it's a process. It's and, a and, they yeah. keep, and they keep a big fraction of it. Like, now I understand why when you're, taking, when you're like, you know, getting in the cab and you said you take credit cards, the guy will often sigh. And that's because the you know, Visa or whoever gets a cut of it, which you don't, as a consumer, you don't, you're thinking, what, I'm paying you, what do you care? But no, they, it's a, they take a big cut. Like we sell books or whatever at an event, we have to tell the authors beforehand, you know, for credit card payments – you know, don't think you're getting the full cover price of your book because we got to send this much. So, and, and then when I talk to some people who are interested in Bitcoin, that's the thing that fascinates. They don't care about inflation or what you know, they, because they don't even know that stuff. You know, they they don't know Austrian theory or they don't care about the business cycle. They just care about, man, these big financial institutions, these middlemen are just earning so much money off of these transaction fees. Wouldn't it be great to kind of cut them out and and just do it peer to peer? Oh, it's amazing. There was a, a transaction on the block. I don't know how often you watch the blockchain. It's so fun. I, lo I love to watch it in real time. One of the things I do when I talk is I, I will actually show a, a live real-time graphic of blockchain transactions taking place as a way of underscoring the point that whatever I say here and whatever you're thinking probably doesn't matter because this is like taking place anyway. You know? <laughs> um, but there was a, a transaction that came over the other day for $80 million. You know, just yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, and it costs four cents to transact. <laughs> that what that wasn't your helicopter ride, right? <laughs> no, that yeah, that, I would have had to buy a whole fleet of helicopters. Nobody really knows what the transaction was. I mean, I, I think there's a presumption that it must have been some exchange moving money from one wallet to another, something like that. But and, and that, and that's what's so fascinating too is th that that beautifully crystallizes the issue of like a a public ledger, but yet pseudo anonymity that. We can all be aware that this thing happened, but we don't know what it was. You know, that's it, I love that. It's just it's such a neat thing. <laughs> hey, uh, listen, you and I were dangerous on this topic, and we need to put call us uh, call a uh, stop to this. Um, but you know, in my my new book, um, bit by bit, um, what it what it attempts to do is is characterize Bitcoin as one probably the most impressive application of of a more general issue of peer-to-peer uh, -peer technology and distributed networks and open source uh, programming uh, development and these kinds of things that are driving forward a whole series of changes. Have you reflected uh, that much on whether and to what extent these new technologies are posing some kind of fundamental challenge to our traditional very strict divisions between public and private property? Like we, We've always thought about private property as being you know things you hold, right. things you think, and then public property is being probably state owned, and maybe there's such a thing as a commons, but you know that comes about in a rare cases through public agreement or something like that. But now you have these distributed networks that are sort of owned by everybody and nobody and everybody. And, you know, it's it's all. I mean, d does it play with? You? Does it do? Um, yeah, mental so on you. And, I, and it's um, it, it, this. I'm not just buttering you up here. It really did. That idea came because you gave a talk one time, um, and you were you were saying something like, 
you you were referencing the the gospel like when Jesus fed five thousand people or whatever, and you were saying why is that a miracle? Because he took some scarce physical thing like bread and and copied it and and fed you know. And you were saying, but it, when it comes to electronic information, you know, digital information, that that we we have that access to that where you know you, by making copies of it, you're not taking away from the first person, and that that really has set me down this. And the same thing here that it's I, I think you're right that. I almost wonder if the, the stuff that traditional leftists worry about, you know, like, you guys are so greedy, you capitalists, you know, building fences around and keep people off my land, this is mine, and you're so greedy and grasping. We can sympathize with them when it comes to so-called intellectual property. Like, you can understand how, no, don't you get it, man? Like, don't try to hold on to your song or your your, your novel. Let the world have it, and you'll well, end up richer, you know? Yeah, right, so, right. It's it's kind of like I I think there is that issue. So again, I don't want people to misunderstand me. I'm not saying property rights aren't important or whatever, but I'm I'm just saying I think that that issue that like when you change your mentality and just like just try to you know give stuff to the world, you know that that in the long run is going to make you wealthier, even measured materially, be, because it's that there's so much that could be created once we unleash people. And allow them just to be productive and to create things. It's not going to be an issue of you know feeding billions of people. That's that's going to be nothing. You know, what I mean, that what this earth is capable of of giving people when they unleash their creativity. And I think things like Bitcoin and what have you, like just this new intellectual application or way of humans of interacting with each other, we're just scratching the surface of it. And yeah. Like one analogy I use is to say when when people go into a restaurant right now and they order water, it's free. It's not because technically it's free, but it's just because that's that's nothing. Whereas maybe you know a hundred years ago or so, or like if you're in the middle of a desert and that's all we knew is living in a desert, and someone said water should be free, you'd say you socialist, you Marxist. But in the capitalist modern world, water basically is free in certain. You, you get what I'm saying? So I think it's yeah. it's that kind of thing that yeah, we're it's, really so rich that a lot of what traditional leftists want would be fine, but the, again, on the other hand, like the people who believe in property rights are also correct to say, well, no, there has to be, right. but don't you understand, if you just would stop stealing from people through the state, we would have so much abundance that there wouldn't be homeless people and blah, 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 so. Yeah, it's a little mystifying, and it's going to take me a while, even though I've, I've finished the book, you know, and it's it's going to print, I guess, next week, I'm not sure that I'm really prepared to fully understand the, the implications of, of all these things. And, but that's great, you know. I mean, one of the things that, that's really cool about being, uh, you know, a, a liberal, libertarian, you know, in this idea space is that you eventually realize that society is smarter than you, you know. <laughs> that, right. That, that uh, crowdsourced information is always going to beat uh, even the, the most genius individual brain in terms of understanding the you know the potential of of the material world. Right, because because we're part of the group. You know what I mean? It's not a matter of is the are these people over here smarter than you? It's are you plus the group smarter than you alone? Well, of course you are. Any right. any great idea you have can go into the mix. Right, and it's a little bit humbling, but in a in a good kind of way, you know. Um, so I've been reading a lot of a lot of Hayek. In fact, a lot of the things I used to read in Hayek that I couldn't really understand are now making sense to me for the for the first time. Yeah, yeah. It's I have have had the same thing that it's um, you know the spontaneous order and all this stuff and just drawing on the dispersed localized yeah. knowledge and that's you really see that all these people coming together like at a Bitcoin conference and people have their own because like I said I was sitting back there as a sort of as an economist. In a a watcher of states and the kind of stuff they do, and I realized, holy cow! If this thing took off, do you know the implications? Whereas, the you know the other guy who just cares about cryptography, he doesn't even know. You know, he's like, no, don't you see how neat this is? And I don't even know what he's talking about. But <laughs> there was a funny moment that happened. Uh, I guess as the last Freedom Fest, I was on a panel with George Gilder, and the moderator of the panel wanted to know who understands Bitcoin. So she said, "Who here understands Bitcoin?" A ton of hands went up. And then she said, who here does not understand Bitcoin? And some hands went up, but one of those hands was George Gilder. Yeah. You know, <laughs> on the panel with him. Now, he's got a big book coming out on the subject, and I'm telling you, if anybody understands Bitcoin, it's George Gilder. But he, his point of putting up his hand was that, like, no, uh, I, Bitcoin is bigger than me. It's more yeah. brilliant than I am, and there's no amount of understanding I could ever acquire that could compare to the to the the knowledge embedded in this emergent technology now and in the future, I thought that was 
like I don't know if anybody else saw that happen, but I thought it was a beautiful symbol. Yeah, I was actually in the the crowd there, and I I did notice that, and I thought that was a good. Yeah. It, but also to give, to give courage to people to raise their hands too. I think that's good when you admit. <laughs> well, I felt bad afterwards that I didn't raise my hand. I was like, "Oh, here I am, you know, acting like I know everything." You know, George Gilder's over here going, "I don't know anything." <laughs> but Bob, I won't take up any more of your time. Really a pleasure to talk to you. And people can download your book for free, which is just beautiful. Um, my book is coming out in probably I don't know ten days or something like that. And uh, unfortunately, it. It's not for free, but you can get it on Amazon. Um, <laughs> but this podcast is for free, so yeah. Maybe, yeah you know. Again, it's uh, thank you, and it's understandingbitcoin.us is where we'll have the latest version at any given time. Yeah, and I'll customize the uh, the YouTube once once okay. we finish the podcast and, and put the link out there. Thanks, Bob. Wonderful okay, to visit. Thanks, Good luck thank with everything. You. All right, All right. So, thanks.